systems analysis um, tool for improved health systems. This is um, a, a series that um, we are very passionate about um, in that we want to support practitioners in terms of building their skills um, and also trying to support them with regards to capacities around how they deal with complex issues in their routine and um, everyday work. So we have a series of tools that we introduced last month regarding um, what should be done and what is available out there as a toolbox for managers, practitioners, researchers, and academics in, in, in health systems, public, uh, public health broadly um, to use. Today, we are continuing with that, with that session. And today's topic, um, as we would see, a Hi, Tina. I think Gina is off, Martina. Okay. She's, discon she's disconnected. Uh, I thought maybe it was from my side. Um, okay. Sorry about that. I dropped <laughs> my my line dropped. Um, so, like I was saying, today we are looking at group model building methodologies using rich pictures, interrelationship diagrams, and causal loop diagrams. Um, this is one some of the things that we introduce you to, and we have no. Uh, other person than Martina Lembani, Dr. Martina Lembani, who is going to take us through. She's going to take us through using three case studies. And please uh, pardon me if you hear any background noise. I have um, a minor, a very active minor around me whom <laughs> I can shut up. So please bear with me. Um, so today we are going to look at three key case studies, one from La Côte d'Ivoire in West Africa and then Nigeria equally in West Africa um, in terms of uh, responsive and re resilience building uh, within the health systems and how you can use these methodologies to support your, yourself and understand what is going on, as well as the routine resilience issues within South African context. So you will see a lot of examples coming through and, and you can relate to some of these things. Others will be new to you, but I guess with the COVID and as we are trying to make sense of situations now, this is very, very important for us to have some of these tools in terms of how we can manage situations and crisis, but most importantly, how we can manage our health sector and our health services so that we don't disappoint our clients and our patients. So without much ado, I hope you enjoy today's session and um, I'll leave you to Martina, um, who will take you through this session. Thank you very much and enjoy the session. Martina, over to you. Thank you, Gina, uh, for that uh, very precise and concise um, introduction. So um, I will put on my camera, but only briefly so that at least people just know who is behind um, the, the whole presentation. I know some people were there last month when we did our first series, they may remember me, but others who are attending today for the first time, I think um, it just would be a good idea so that they know who is speaking, but uh, once I start the presentation, I will just um, you know, switch off my video just to help with uh, also people, um, the data and all that. So um, as Gina has indicated, my name is uh, Martina Limbani. I'm based at the School of Public Health, University of the Western Cape. Um, I joined the school in 2014 as a postdoctoral research fellow, um, and which I did most of this work that I'm going to present now. Um, but now I do other things as well. I teach um, a course on uh, primary health care, um, and in addition to other you know, modules that I assist um, in the school. 
So with uh, that brief introduction, I would like to go straight to my presentation of today. But before I do so, I just want to uh, maybe say um, some housekeeping issues. So first of all, with um, I know with the last presentation, most people had asked for a recording, especially those who didn't make it. Um, so we just wondered whether it's okay again for us to record today for the benefit of those who might not be here, but we understand with the poppy and all that, we just you know, want to get an okay from everybody uh, before we do so. Maybe, yeah. Thanks, Mama Tena, I've seen your hand and others, just you know, tell us in the chat or with your emotions, reactions, then we'll be able to see what to do. And uh, another issue that I wanted to uh, in raise is regards to uh, CPD points. That's uh, for people who are registered with uh, some health um, profession, like maybe if you're a doctor or pharmacist and people want to take CPD points, I think there are some issues related to those who are based in South Africa, which might be more straightforward than those that are not based in South Africa. And um, um, Zianda, are you there? Do you wanna clarify something on that? If I move. Just checking if she is. Um, yeah, but I think she will probably also write the details um, in the chat so that people can um, get the full information around this. Okay, thank you. So I'll go straight on with my presentation now and switch off my video. So yes, I will be looking at uh, the group model building methodology as um, a way of um, you know, understanding health systems and uh, trying to um, unravel the complexities around it and then also rich pictures, interaction diagram, and um, the causal loop diagrams with those case studies, which I will elaborate later on. And then, um, yeah, just to talk about systems thinking as a, a worldview. So he was saying that systems and systems problems are more than the sum of the systems individual components. So why that is because, you know, systems thinking acknowledges that behaviors or problems emerge over time as a result of interactions and uh, relationships among both the internal as well as external system components. So it's, it's not um, static. You see that over time, the, the system also changes that's why we say we're working with dynamic systems so um we are looking at uh these different components or these external internal companies that keep on changing that make up that system so we need to understand the system in from you know that angle or that worldview um and then systems thinking as a process um here we're saying that systems thinking is um, an ordered methodological approach to understanding problem situations and identifying solutions to these uh, problems. And therefore it takes into account both the forest and the trees in it. So the, 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 the different components, and this is done through a process of synthesis, analysis and inquiry. And this is, I think, the main um, theme of this whole series, that we want to help um, each other to understand what kind of methodologies, what is it that we can do to be able to synthesize or analyze and do some inquiry around the systems around us uh, to help us make sense of what is going on and how we can solve some of those system problems that we've been struggling with for a long time. Uh, just a sort of a, an illustration about um, how you know people can use this systems um, thinking 
methodologies or tools. So somebody said, so a lot of people can actually apply conversational systems thinking skills. So about 95 to 100%. So all the opinion leaders, policymakers, everyone, because I mean, we are all, found, we all find ourselves in some form of system. So we understand some components in there and we can speak to a few of those. That's already systems thinking. We, we can co co connect a few dots here and there within our system. So hence, Almost everybody can converse it, can you know, do something and understand or converse it about the system they're in. But moving further on, you find that uh, about maybe 40 to 50 percent can build some simple um, maps around the system they're in. So I would say maybe most of us in this room, we can, you know, to some extent do this, build some simple maps you know, yeah, we can do some concept maps, we can do something maybe within our office and see what, you know, how the different systems work together. And then moving further down, you, re you realize that only about maybe 15 to 20 people are able to actually now build some simple models. Um, so the first one was just the maps where you're just like, you know, connecting this and can interact with that. But with the models, then there you are using maybe data, you are using you know, some kind of simulation. And then there is a very small um, uh, percentage of people, about 2%, who can really build these complex models that uh, maybe at, at very big scale uh, trying to simulate or model situations. So just to give um, a picture on that as well. And um, then before we go further, I just wanted to recap like some of the, the examples that um, we Gina went through last month when she did her presentation. So she talked about the different tools such as process mapping, outcome mapping, mind mapping, reflective practice, soft system methodology, systems dynamics, uh, modeling, social network, causal loop, concept, mapping, aspect models, and uh, rich pictures, and, and, and. So they are quite a number, but I thought I should just take. And in, in each one of these um, different tools, they help us to accomplish, you know, different uh, things within the system. So as I said earlier, there are some that will help us to do synthesis uh, of the system, of the issues, others that will help us to do more of the analysis, and then there are others that are more to do with inquiry. So, and then also it depends on what question you are asking or what kind of problem you are trying to solve. If it's more of an internal systems thing, maybe you will want to do something different. You want to do a, use a different uh, tool. Maybe if you are looking at a whole system, like a whole sector, you look at a totally different tool as well. Um, moving forward. So um, in general, what do these system tools do to us? So they help us to make sense of the complexity. As we have seen that it's, we're dealing with different components. And they also allow us to model a situation over time, as uh, I indicated also earlier, that uh, these systems change um, because of the interactions that are going on at different times. And then also it enables us to collaborate and share uh, information or resources that are in that system. And then uh, finally, we'll see that this can either be qualitative or quantitative. So as we go through the presentation, you'll be able to you know, see how maybe the tools that we use in this in these case studies were able to help us make sense of the complexity and you know, sort of model situations over time and how it enabled collaboration and sharing. And yeah, the others. So uh, maybe let me pause there in case there are any questions and uh, whatnot before I move on to my next slide, which is now the actual application of the, um, the case studies using this, uh, the, the, the systems methodology and tools that I just mentioned earlier. 
Are there any questions or comments? I can also try to say in the chat. Okay, I don't see any questions yet. So hopefully I can move on. But if maybe I'm too fast, please feel free also just to stop me so that I can slow um, a bit so that everybody understands. So uh, the next slide um, is simply now the introduction of the actual case studies that I'm going to look at. Um, so this case studies are based on a project that was called Health Systems Resilience, a Systems Dynamics Analysis. And uh, the first case study was uh, on coated worm as um, indicated earlier on. So this um, project in general was looking at resilience of health systems and more specifically in times of crisis. So we looked at case studies um, in places where there was some kind of crisis going on or had, had just taken place. So with the coded by case study, it, uh, it was based on the, um, uh, the, it was like the, the, the 2010, 11 elections where one of the, the, I mean, the incumbent president didn't want to accept the results of the election and he protested, he didn't want to leave office and the opposition who had then won also didn't uh, want to give up. And so there was war going on and uh, yeah, it was like a very bad crisis at that time. And that meant that certain services were disrupted in the country. And in this case, we are specifically interested uh, looking at the HIV services in that period. And uh, more especially also antiretrofinal therapy where we, we usually we don't want people to discontinue with um, the, their um, treatment. So how did it happen? How were, was the system still able to provide all this? And uh, maybe just to you know come back a little bit in terms of background, this project was implemented as a collaboration between the Melman uh, School of Public Health, Columbia University, New York, and um, University of the Western Cape School of Public Health. And I was the uh, pro program manager for this particular uh, project. So this particular case study was done as a desktop analysis uh, as we didn't physically travel to Cote d'Ivoire, uh, but we did it with uh, stakeholders um, are based at the Columbia University in New York because the, the partner that we wanted to work with was funded by ICAP and ICAP is based at Columbia University. So we sit there, uh, first of all, just going through the methodology process, how we wanna do, um, you know, this, the, uh, how we wanna work through the, the, the processes, we use the methodology. And then we did some Skype interviews. We thought that we are based in uh, Cote d'Ivoire at the time. So the, the project manager for ICAP, we're dealing with uh, HIV services in that specific time. And then we identified people who were collaborating on that project, but they were still based, at that time they were based in New York. Some of them outside of New York, but we also had like the Skype interviews with them. So that was like the first case study. And then the second one was um, uh, the one on Boko Haram. And uh, this one was a case study on Yobe State. So, in Nigeria, as you may recall, at around 2011, from there about 2011 until 2014, when we did these case studies, there was um, an insurgency of this Boko Haram who were terrorizing, especially the northern parts of Nigeria. And Yobe State is one of those states in there, and they were also uh, highly affected with this. And in this case study, we worked with um, an NGO that was working on maternal and neonatal um, uh, and child healthcare services. And we um, 
in this one, we had to travel, although it was quite scary at the time, but we still had to, to go there. So what happened, I had to travel to Abuja, the capital of um, Nigeria. And then we asked colleagues from Yobe State to come down and work with us um, in Abuja. Also because foreigners, we are not allowed to travel to those states because of the, the situation. And just to say like, I think it was three weeks before I traveled, there was actually also a bomb in Abuja and it was quite scary, but anyhow, I still had to travel and um, do the work. So that's the background about the, uh, the Nigerian case study. And then the last one was uh, um, here in South Africa and the Eastern Cape in a district called Oaratambo. And it was based on a case study on, on maternal and um, oh, maternal health, uh, maternal health services. And in, in, in this case study, it wasn't necessarily like the two other case studies where you're looking at the you know, actual war where people are killing each other or bombing each other. But in this case, it was more of a context of um, um, chronic you know, health kind of non-performance, I would, I would say. So they were like issues about the, um, the district also in particular not performing well in terms of maternal health indicators. As you see here on here in 2013, so South African maternal health was uh, uh, 140,000 uh, live births, while for Oara Tambo district, it was 230, which was quite way above the you know, country average. So it was um, kind of for us very interesting to see what was going on there. And by that time, UWC, okay, so our department, we are already doing another project like helping uh, that particular district with some, you know, health systems approach to how they can better, you know, perform or, you know, do better in some of the indicators they had specifically asked for that help. So when this project came in, they gladly also accepted that they were willing to work with us so that maybe it could help them understand what is it that is uh, making them not to progress as they would want to. So for, for the sake of this presentation uh, and to make things much easier, I will concentrate on this particular case study, although the methodology and everything that was done was more or less the same with some modifications here and there as you, you would have heard, like one of them was a desktop and then the other one, of course, we had to get people from Nigeria, uh, I mean, uh, Yobe State coming to Abuja. But this one was the one where we actually traveled to the actual you know, place. So Eastern Cape or Atambo and interacted with everyone who we, we were able to find in that context. So I would dwell in, uh, on this case study, which I think would also speak more to most of us as maybe we are not necessarily in a war situation, but definitely our health systems in one way or another are having you know, issues that we need to address. So yeah, we, we, we did use this model, uh, group model building, and I just want to highlight what it is all about, what is this methodology all about. So according to Vennings, um, the group model building is a process in which team members exchange their perceptions of a problem and explore such questions as, what exactly is the problem we fix? How did the problematic situation originate? What might be its underlying cause? And how can the problem be tackled? So those are some of the questions one will be asking in this kind of met methodology to guide you. And then uh, according to Richardson and Anderson, um, they also say that group model building as we they intend it, is, as intended in the phrase itself, signals the intent to involve a relatively uh, large group of people in the business of uh, developing or formulating a model and not just conceptualization. 
but rather moving further to actually building that model. So you expect at least a group of people to be involved in this particular, when, when you're doing this, uh, you're using this particular methodology. But the question is, why would one want to involve a large number of people in a modeling process? So I want to pause there and um, just ask for, for people to add in the chat. What do you think? Why do you think one would be, you know, want to involve a large group of people in the modeling process? What comes to your mind? Why do you think you need more people to be involved in this process? I'll wait for a minute or so just to see what people have to say. Thank you, I see. Yes, diversity of viewpoints. We see things differently. Sense making, consensus building and ownership. Great, and I think they are all great points and uh, yeah um we we can't of emphasize over emphasize on any any one of those and this is exactly what uh, it is so in just to summarize we'll just pick a few maybe we, we might not even exhaust everything but um some of the points i have here include that uh, uh using more people helps like in terms of insights that come from that uh, uh group model or from that process as you involve um people with diverse backgrounds and um diverse roles and people from different components of the system itself and therefore different um knowledge as well so somebody mentioned about um ownership so definitely that likelihood of implementation of a process or, or, or a policy that may come out of this process is much more guaranteed if people were involved and then also participation as an intervention itself because as people interact it helps with social contract construction of new realities as people exchange ideas and they they dive deep into that issue it you know, definitely uh, brings in new issues that people never thought of. And that helps also in the process of how then they can better intervene in the situation. But it also helps to change mental models uh, amongst participants. Many times you realize that when you start, you know, this kind of conversations, people would have had their own standpoint. They will say, okay, this is not moving or it's not working because of uh, so and so. But once you start this process, people's understanding of their mental models or their subjectivities totally disappear as the process unfolds. So, and that then helps people to be more open and then they can also understand where they themselves are not doing their part and how best they can support the system. And then also it provides opportunity for people to be involved in designing systems that are intended to benefit them. Yeah, of course, if you know this is something that is going to you know, benefit me, maybe you can also put in a little bit more effort into it and further direct it. And because you know it's going to benefit you, you will you know, try to contribute as effectively as possible. And you can also use the same process for theater build, building. Um, and if you, you have experts in the room who can you know, also look at what are some of the existing theories around that issue and what are we taking you know, moving forward, then you can build up on certain theories that are already existing. And also as an information source, as I already alluded to. So here, I just want to um, like, I know it's, very small, you might not see, and it's not, don't worry, because the next slide is going to summarize all this, but just to say the, the processes that one has to consider when doing a group model building process. So one is here what we call the scoping of the problem, and here you're trying to um, understand uh, the, the, the problem by collecting 
like preliminary um, information, conducting interviews, and then determining the problem boundary, and then uh, surface what the, the, the definition of that specific problem you want to work on. So it has to be very well bounded. And then in there, you're also trying to understand who or identify who the key stakeholders are uh, to enable you know, that process of group model building. So you will be inviting those people into that uh, big session. And then here you also have to identify what they call the core model team planning. So you have a team, it could be researchers, outsiders who come, and then those people who are involved in the, you know, in, in the system itself. So they're coming together, strategizing, planning, and you know, taking the process through, through the modeling to the end. And once you have done all this, then you come to the actual group model uh, development itself, where you are now building those causal loop diagrams, identifying what um, the feedback loops are, what are the leverage points. And once you're done that, then you can disseminate the information or refine your models as you bounce it uh, with more stakeholders as uh, the final stage. So um, as I said, I, um, I have like a summary now. So that's like the generic that one would do. And now here I'm having a bit more of details in terms of how we did it. So as in this specific um, research process. So the first thing that we did was, as I, um, I said, to clearly, frame the, the problem. So that is between the, the research team and ourselves and then they get keepers who are the stakeholders. And then after that, once we identified the problem, then we did these key interviews, I mean, uh, key informant interviews with some stakeholders. And that was mostly through snowballing. We'd have maybe the first, five or maybe four or five key stakeholders that we needed to meet to talk to maybe the district manager or some you know pharmacy person or whosoever depending on the issue that we're looking at and then once we start interviewing them asking questions then they would always say okay but this i think you need to meet such and such a person so that they can give you more information and then after we have collected all that information, then we came together as a research team and those, um, so those in the planning team plus those gatekeepers would have two, maybe two, three, depending on their availability. As we know, most of them are quite very busy people. So we could then um, look at the interviews try to identify what the key issues were, which are then grouped and uh, um, converted into some form of variables. And then we would define each one of the variables so that we all have a common understanding of what that um, actually variable means because the same thing can mean different things to different people. So we had to ensure at this point that we all have the same understanding of each one of those variables. And uh, then after that, would call for the group mod, uh, the group model uh, building session, which is a big meeting where we invite people. So some of them would be people who uh, participated in the interviews, and others were not, um, uh, you know, did not part participate in those interviews, but they are key in this process. And then in this group meeting, then that's where we we'll draw the rich pictures and then draw the interrelationship. Uh, diagrams and all that. But just to emphasize that according to the um, developers of this methodology, of which one of them is called Peter Hoffman, for those people who will be interested to read a bit more, I can give you uh, literature and yeah, material that you can go through uh, all that. So it recommends that um, the group model should have people between six to 20, but he recommends that actually 
the best it's between 12 to 15 because then everybody has a good chance to participate and all that but in this particular um, study with eastern cape uh, i think with the interviews people realized that there was a lot of interest and those that we had talked to the gatekeepers they really wanted like almost everyone in the district to be involved but that was not possible and then after all negotiations, uh, trying to limit the numbers, it didn't work. We ended up having 24 participants in the room. Uh, some that we didn't invite, they were just invited by others. So let's go and, you know, I think it's important that you be in this room. So in that particular group uh, model session, we divided people in small groups and then um, people would uh, just to ensure that everybody is participating so that then they would draw rich pictures in those small groups. Most of the interrelationship diagrams we did in those groups and even the causal loop diagrams, which of course I will come uh, later to that. So ideally the process, if we had all the time, it would take about maybe three days. So you come in the morning, you sit and identify you know, draw the rich pictures and then I describe all the variables that have come up and define all of them together. But considering that most of the case studies where we did, we were working with very um, busy people, um, high top officials in government. So what we did was to like more or less do the, the most of the, this tough work with individual people in the background. So when we did those interviews and all that synthesis, it meant that we have cut a lot of time. When we went into the actual meeting, all we did was to ask people to draw these rich pictures. And then after that, discuss like, so what are some of the issues that are coming out? And then people gave us those issues. And then uh, we immediately then brought up what we had found out from the interviews for them to confirm or maybe reject or add on or re remove some of them. But in this case, we found that like all, all the variables that came up, they agreed with them, they confirmed them as the key variables within um, addressing the problem that we're looking at. And then they also added a few more. So from there, then um, we, we went ahead through the whole process, which I think I will now just go through into so that we understand what these um, entail. So starting with um, the rich picture. Um, so a rich picture is supposed to be um, a tool that helps with um, synthesis of information around the complex health system or a, a complex system that you are looking at to help you to understand the problem. So people are simply asked to take a piece of paper and draw anything that comes to their mind that reminds them of what happens a, around this problem that we are looking at within the system. So in this case, because we are looking at maternal health, as you will see in this picture, so they are, um, you know, houses or maybe people's homes, you see the, the, the hospital, you see pregnant women, you see some vehicles, probably ambulances. And then they also try to show the terrain through which these women have to walk like long distances, you know, and all that. So it wasn't just this. So we had different groups, as I said, small groups and each one of the small group also came up with their own uh, rich picture. Um, ideally, you can ask people, each, each individual, to draw their own, and then they discuss as a group, and then agree on one and put all the different elements. It's uh, usually encouraged also that people just use pictures, but you can also use a few words, because sometimes you are not really able to draw, if you are not a, a, such a good artist like me, you might want to you know, chip in a few words so that people understand what your picture is talking about. So during this uh, stage, people then discuss a lot about what they mean about this and what they mean about that. And that's where you generate all those issues and variables. 
So once we are done with that, then we move on to the actual I variables that we have identified. So in this case, we identified um, those um, different variables. And um, the first one here is called quality of care. And then we had effectiveness of referral systems. We had maternal mortality. Of course, maternal mortality was anyway supposed to be there because that's the outcome of interest. We are trying to understand why we have high maternal mortality in, um, in, in our term. So when you are doing your, um, like this case, we, we have moved to the, the, the variables and we want now to draw our interrelationship diagram. You always have to ensure that your um, variable of interest, which is the outcome of interest must be in here. And then the other things that came up were availability of drug supplies and then impact of structural changes in the district, equipment, maintenance, and staff support, transport availability, staff at attitudes, use of data for management, leadership and team building, internal accountability, impact of NGOs, staff competence and confidence, staff training, HR availability, and personal management. So then each one of these variables had to be defined and we had um, like um, a paper like where everything is defined so that everybody is referring to it. When they are doing any comments or they are trying to link one variable to another, they have to know what actually each one of these variables means. So then at the next thing that we had to do was now to, to do the, 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 I mean, linkages of the, these different variables. But before you, we go there, I just want us to reflect why the interrelationship diagrams are important, what do we use them for. So the, these IRDs actually force us to consider all possible interactions among the variables as you will see in the next slide, how the process is done. And it also in the process challenges our mental models and also helps us make use of team knowledge in the absence of hard data, because then you have people from different, um, maybe departments playing different roles. And uh, yeah, because we are in that process and each one of them knows a little bit more about this, then we, we help each other to, you know, to um, actually make sense of what should ha be happening or what is happening. And then also helps us to see that complexity as you also see in, in the next slide. And then in the final analysis, of course, it helps us also to build consensus on priorities. So which one is more, when we, when we are doing the interrelationship diagram, we also ask what is the relationship and which one is affecting the other. And you can also debate there for quite a long time. So eventually you have to prioritize which one you think affects the other more and build that consensus. So here is the um, interrelationship diagram that then we created from those variables. And how it works is um, you start with one variable and then you ask questions um, around, like going through all the variables until you come to the last one and then you do the same. So I will just give an example here. So we have quality of care. So the question that you will ask is that, is there a relationship between quality of care and effectiveness of referral system? And if the answer is yes, then the next question is, which one affects the other? Does quality of care affect effectiveness of, re of referral system or effectiveness of re uh, referral systems affect quality of care? So this is how you identify which way the arrow should go. And in this, in this particular context, the, after the discussions, people said, no, it's effect effectiveness of uh, referral systems that actually affect quality of care. So the arrow was drawn from effectiveness of referral system towards quality of care. 
So then they, you go to the next variable. Is there a relationship between quality of care and maternal mortality? And again, here, the, the, the team said, yes, there is a relationship. But now you realize the arrow is coming from quality of care towards maternal mortality. So it means that uh, quality of care is the one that actually affects maternal mortality, either that make it go high or lower. And then the same question is asked, is there a um, relationship between quality of care and availability of drug supplies? So again, they said, yes, there is a relationship, but the relationship now is that uh, availability of uh, drug supplies affect quality of care. And then we went on, does quality of care and impact of structural changes, is there any relationship? They seem not to have identified uh, any direct relationship so far. So then we just skip that. Then we go to the next. Is there a relationship between quality of care and equipment or maintenance? And the, the answer was yes. So there was again um, an arrow drawn from there to quality of care. So in this process, it means people are being forced to critically look at each one of these variables. And once you have done with quality of care and you have drawn the arrows going to quality of care or out of quality of care, you move on to the next um, variable, which is effectiveness of uh, referral system. The same way you ask because this and this have already been done. So you just start with the effectiveness of referral systems there in a relationship between it and maternal mortality. And then the answer was yes, and that those referral systems actually affect maternal mortality. And again, there's effectiveness of referral mortality. I mean, is there a relationship between this and availability of drugs? If there is, but in this case, um, it doesn't seem to have had any relationship. So they didn't have an arrow, then you just move to the next, which will be now effectiveness of referral systems to impact of structural changes. If there's none, you move on to the next. Until effectiveness of referral systems has been, you know, uh, compared with all the other uh, variables. And then you move on to maternal mortality and you do the same. You move to this, you do the same. So you can imagine this is a process that can take you quite long because you are really trying to force yourself to understand your system or the issue that you're trying to understand it into detail. So because of that, um, we, yeah, we thought it would make more sense for a smaller team of people to actually do that and then bring it here. Because if we are going to do this in that one day session of group model, this thing can take uh, probably half the morning and especially where you have a big team of people and they are arguing. Sometimes people, there are certain variables that are quite difficult and people have to uh, really debate whether HR availability is the one that is affecting leadership or leadership is the one that is affecting HR. So in that case, people have to debate to see which one is uh, affecting the other because it can be either way. And then all the time they have to choose one, it, it has to be a one directional. So that's where we're saying it helps people to, to prioritize. So which one is more important be, between this and this, although both of them are important, but which one is it's more of a priority. Um, maybe let me pause there if there are any questions. So this far, the rich picture and the interrelationship Diagram that I've presented so far. Any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. I see, Gina, I see that we don't have anything in the chat. So then I will just proceed. But I hope it's making sense. Please just give me a nod or some reaction so that I know we are in the same boat. I'm not leaving anyone behind. I'm not being too fast or anything. Just will be helpful. So I will then move on to the next step.
that um, will help us. So it's an incremental kind of uh, process. Um, the, the bigger methodology is group model building, and then the different tools are helping us to build. So the rich picture helped us to generate the variables. And then the interrelationship diagram is helping us to now kind of um, analyze, do some kind of an analysis of this all information coming through, you know, linking the different variables. But eventually we need to get to the place where we can build our model, which is like the core, as a, the, the methodology says, group model building. And that's where we use the causal loop diagrams. So after we have done all that, we will then look at the arrows. So here, what we do is to count the in arrows and the out arrows. So you count like how many arrows came into quality of care, one, two, three, whatever. Maybe you find that out of the 12 variables, maybe 11 were coming in only one was going out, or maybe all of them actually were going in into there, and then there was nothing going out. So you write um, 11 in, 11 out, zero, or whatever the number is. And you do that for all the variables around, because this is what is going to help you to identify what are your outcome variables and what are your drivers. So, the thing is, the, arrow, the, the variable that has more arrows coming in, it's an outcome variable. And the one that you have most of the arrows coming out, it's a driver, so it's a, a driver. So the one with most arrows going in will be like the, 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 the key variable. And the one that... Um, is most of the arrows are coming out will be like the, the, the key driver from all of them. And then of course, you also have a few that will have also more arrows coming out. And then also like here, you see more are coming there than out. So this is one of the key outcomes, staff attitudes. So you just, it, like, like at a glance, it shows you like what are these, you know, key outcomes in this. And what are these key drivers in this whole process? So based on this, that's when you start creating your, um, first of all, what we call the seed model to help you start building your um, model through the causal loop diagrams. So in the next slide here, I'm showing what you call the um, seed or base structure. And there, what you usually do is to make sure that one, you have first of all your outcome in, of interest at the end there, in our case, which is mortal, maternal mortality. And then you also have to add in your key outcome, in this case was the quality of care. And then you also have to have your key driver, in our case, which was um, leadership. As you may have seen here, we had leadership and team building. We also had staff competence and confidence as uh, one of those. And then there are others that are just like more or less in between. You have half, half, half of them going out, half of them, you know, uh, coming in. So um, in this seed model, then you just try to take those key um, variables to put them in here on which you are going to base your model. So in the next slide, then I'm showing um, now the causal loop diagram that the, the team would have started building. And in this case, for the Eastern Cape, we had three groups that were working like in smaller groups. So they, we had more or less like three different types of these. But depending on the team, they all were, you know, adding like different variables here and there. And then at the end of the day, we had to sort of merge all those different ones. But in the real, like ideal situation, you would all sit in one place and maybe have a big board where people are drawing and, you know, adding uh, everything together if you have all the time. But due to time, then you just make people like start practicing and discussing, you know, 
generating a lot of ideas and new realities coming mm -hmm. up because that's the essence. So it's part of the intervention as well as people you know, try to engage with the issues at hand. And so we kept on building it. And just for your information, we say that these um, loop diagrams or these models, they never, you, you can never have like a final one, like a finalized kind of model because it always keeps on building up. You can always realize, as we said, there's always changes, components within the system, both internal and external are changing. So you can just, if you have it like in your office, you, you can make it as small as a living document. As things emerge, you can come and add to say, okay, now we see there's something that has come up and it's affecting it, the, the system in this way. You just add in that uh, particular uh, variable or issue. So um, now I will draw a little bit more on this, which is now our final causal loop diagram that we did for Eastern Cape. Um, as I said, it's not final, final, as you will see, there are not um, a lot of variables yet. And we had hoped once they get back to their offices, maybe they can call for another meeting where they will, you know, sit and work a little bit more on it, uh, add more variables, make more sense of it. But for us as a research team, within the limited time, this is how far we went with this process. So just a few things to highlight on this um, causal loop diagram. So the causal loop diagram mainly helps us to, to see where are the you know, feedback loops. So feedback loops are basically um, you know, places where you see um, these arrows creating a, a, a ring. Like, so in this case, you can see that there's, um, um, okay, let me rather start from here. So you have here leadership and team building. So um, it was said that leadership and team building, um, and okay, maybe let me just start again to say how one builds the, the, the causal loop diagram, which is slightly different from the questions that you ask when you're doing the interrelationship diagram. When you're doing causal loop diagrams, the question that you ask, once you start with a variable, you say, okay, so this one um, affects uh, staff support as we may already have had in the interrelationship diagram. But the question is, when leadership increases, so you always ask from the positive point of view, when leadership increases, what happens to staff uh, support? So here, the answer was staff support also increases. So you draw the arrow and then add a plus sign. So meaning that this, when this increases, it also influences this, it also increases in this, in, and so it's the same direction of things. And then you also realize that staff support also had an effect on staff attitudes and commitment and motivations. So then the question you ask, when staff support increases, what happens to staff attitudes, commitment and motivation? And here it was indicated that staff attitudes also increases and therefore you also put a, a plus sign here and when staff motivation and uh, attitudes increase what happens you realize that leadership and team building also increases because mm -hmm. now everybody's motivated everybody's committed and now this leadership and there's more team building everything is working together it's very synergetic in, in, in this whole process. So now what you will see is that we have created a loop from here to here to here and back, feeding back to leadership. You started with leadership to staff support, to staff attitudes and confidence and commitment and uh, um, motivation back to leadership. And uh, this one becomes what we call and a, a reinforcing loop. So it's a feedback loop, but of reinforcing in nature. So um, you find that for this, the, the, the action, positive action of this variable 
in, also increases um, the outcomes of this variable in a positive manner, the same here and the same here. And so you have the feedback loop and it's called a reinforcing loop. So now let's come to here. We have also um, another feedback loop that I, I want to look at and then um, show you how um, we can find another feedback loop. So we are saying here, staff attitudes, commitment and motivation, they definitely will affect quality of care as we saw there in the interrelationship diagram. But what kind of relationship? So if the staff attitude and commitment increases, quality of care is also what? Increasing. So we have a plus sign here. And then when quality of care increases, what do we see? Patient attendance increases. So we have put here. So we didn't have patient attendance in the um, interrelationship diagram, but when you come drawing causal loop diagram, you always have to put in um, other explanatory variables that will help you to make sense of the whole you know, system. So in this case, we are saying patient attendance increases, but what happens when patient attendance increases? We realize that workload increases. Then we also have a positive um, sign here. But when uh, workload increases, what happens to staff attitudes, uh, commitment and motivation? We realize that this now decreases. So here we put a negative sign. And this one now is no longer a reinforcing loop. It becomes a balancing loop. It's a feedback loop, yes, but it's a balancing one. So a, a balancing loop is a one where processes generate the forces of resistance, which eventually can limit growth. And of course, can also maintain stability and achieve equilibrium because then this forces you now to start doing something. So this is where we have some sort of um, resistance and uh, we will call this a balancing loop. So, in a nutshell, when you have built your, so at first when you're building it, you just do it, you'll be asking those questions when this um, variable, for example, drug availability increases, what happens? Oh, okay, staff competences and confidence also increases because they have the necessary drugs to treat the patients, okay? And what happens when uh, staff capacity and confidence increases? Oh, you find that quality also increases you know, and then you go like that. You just be putting, you know, different variables as you see them fit and which one is speaking to which one within that system. And as I said, this one is nowhere close to being complete, but for the time that we had, we just had to start and do something on it. So at the end, when you have realized that you have built your causal loop diagram, the model is at least as big enough as possible. Then you start identifying this, uh, loops. Then you realize, oh, we have a, a, a balancing loop. Oh, here we have a reinforcing loop. Oh, here we have this and that. And then you use those now to, to start looking at where can we start to intervene. In, you know, it helps you to understand, to identify those key leverage points of intervention. So in this case, then you'll be seeing where do we have to intervene because now we have this workload. And as you see, there is another balancing loop this side because when patients, because there was good quality, there were a lot of patients attending because everybody was very excited with the quality. But what happens eventually is that you have patient waiting times increasing as well. So you have a positive year, but when patient waiting times increase, what happens? patient attendance will start decreasing because now everybody doesn't like to, to be staying at the hospital or at the clinic for five or six hours. Then you will see the attendance also decreasing. In that case, it can actually also um, balance it up itself that then you realize once the attendance is also decreasing, as long as this one is kept constant, you might find that the quality might come back again. But it all depends if the staff were so demoralized, so demotivated, and they decided to move, then maybe this has already by now been distorted 
and it might have ripple effects even to team building and leadership because now leadership is very angry with everybody and therefore not supporting staff anymore everybody in the system is so unhappy and everything will just affect the whole gains that we had you know created so this is how then one interprets um, the causal loop diagrams I don't know if there are any questions on that before I move just to summarize um, this whole process. Do we have anything in the chat, Gina? Okay, we don't have, I have anything. A quick question. Maybe yes. I missed, maybe I missed it. What what is the difference between the blue line, thin thin lines and the gray? lines ah okay so no definitely i didn't mention this so these um i like some of the the, the pathways uh that we we identified so as i i was saying the the these uh feedback loops so you will see here like from here to here to here i put the gray line just to help me it's there simply there to help you identify some of those key pathways or um, feedback loops in the system. So like here, you can see there's this one also going all the way here and you can come down here, here, all right? So it's nothing um, very particular. It's just for to help you to better see those um, feedback loops. You can use to use uh, thicker blue lines you can use to use you can use red lines you can use anything that you you feel comfortable with and you use the same software as the um, interrelationship diagram yes. Okay. yes yes it's the, the Vensim. but i think there are other softwares as well that people use like i think or which other ones but we did use the, the same one, the Vensim, yeah. Thank you for that question. Let me just um, move further down. So yeah, so just uh, some wrap up in terms of what the causal loop diagrams help us with. So they do help us to um, identify those feedback loops and also to see dynamic changes where changes happen over time. And then this will then help us to identify those leverage points or points of intervention with uh, potential for maximum effect. As I said, that you just changing one um, variable somewhere it can have a very bad effect everywhere. So like in this case, just this workload thing can actually wreck the whole system. So if you pay attention to here and how you manage here and yeah, it can actually resolve a lot of issues because once these people get demotivated, then it can also impact on leadership. It can impact on that as much as this is a key, a key um, driver, then uh, if you realize that here things are not, so you'd rather maybe either start working, making sure that this is not uh, weakened so try to intervene as much as possible quickly on this side, or try to you know, intervene somewhere here so that as much as you have work, high workload, what do you wanna do to ensure that those are not so much affected to that level where they become so demotivated? But usually with workload, we know it does that. So, yeah. And then, um, the, 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 it also helps us to know where, you know, policy resistance is, like uh, what are those, some of those unanticipated, uh, unanticipated consequences. Again, coming back the same here. So when you increase your quality of care here, you didn't intend that you want to increase workload. It is just one of those unintended. And you also didn't intend to increase people's waiting time you just really was, were focusing on quality, but you didn't realize that that quality actually will entail more patients that might mean increasing waste, waiting times. 
and that will mean more workload for staff and then patients will not be happy with you they'll be very dissatisfied and all that yeah so and then one can just keep on uh, building that model moving on so just in terms of uh, summary for this particular um, case study we we're saying that quality of leadership was shown to have a pervasive influence on the overall performance of the system by linking to numerous factors and feedback loops, such as uh, staff motivation, which was found to be a reinforcing feedback loop, um, loop one, and then also capacity building um, reinforcing loop two, which um, I didn't actually focus much on, but uh, it's around here where you know with uh, team um, leadership and, and team building which uh, increased uh, um, meant that there was more increased staff support as this team building increased there was more staff confidence and competence and uh, with this competence this there was an increased use of information you know where sometimes we generate a lot of information but if staff are not confident they are not um, competent they are not really able to effectively use that uh, information. But through this, um, when this has increased and they are supporting staff more and they are feeling more confident, they are able to use information better. And uh, of course, there's also here staff training here, which is also feeding into here. And definitely you would also find that this staff support um, in a way is connected to, you know, staff training, the support could actually include staff training in this sense, and it's coming back to leadership. So the same leadership, because it helped to do that, there's more this, so this whole capacity building um, loop is all by, um, because of the leadership uh, build and team building. So basically what we are saying that leadership here had a very uh, great role in terms of uh, bringing in all those reinforcing loop feedback loops that can actually ensure that the system is robust and producing results. But we are saying the extent to which this um, R1, which is loop one, uh, which was around um, um, here on around staff motivation, so we're saying um, the extent to which this loop could become a vicious circle is dependent upon its interaction with um, mm -hmm. a number of other feedback loops. And um, so this is, you know, where I mentioned about here, the workload issues. So if this is going to be maintained, this staff motivation idea is going to be maintained then we have to pay attention to all these other things, you know, that will enable it to be sustained. Um, I saw Gina, did you raise your hand or somebody? Yes, I did. Um, with regards to the question on use of colors, um, is mm. it, could you highlight on how one can choose to use these colors a little bit more? Because, you know, on the negative, re uh, negative, uh, variables you know you sometimes you get people using red color just so mm. that they can highlight those as flashing point to leverage um, you know interventions and stuff and mm. i guess um colors can it, when you're using venison you can use any color of your choice and you mm. can interpret it according to what you think they mean so maybe in terms of easily identify certain variables you can look at some of them as balancing or reinforcing or likely, you know, um, and you can use colors to indicate these things um, yeah. as much as the thickness or the narrowness of the arrows. So I thought you, you should probably highlight on that option available to those who will be trying it for the first time. Yeah, definitely. Um, as I said, it's really your choice if you want to, to say, okay, where there's a balancing uh, loop, you want to use a different color compared to where there is a, a rain Forcing loop, for example, you can also do that. Um, and um, yeah, mm -hmm. in this case, as long as you try to also put this, um, the B, you know, showing like which, which loop um, this is, 
and then uh, if you want maybe to put also the, the arrow i mean the the signs uh red for balancing uh, i mean for negative whatever where there's a balancing rope and then you want to use another color for the plus it's all fine but i think what is most important is just for you to make sure that you have used that negative where there's um, a, 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 an, a decrease of that variable when this other variable is increased. So really with the colors, I think uh, you can use it like in a very, you will see also when um, I show you the other, you know, causal loop diagrams at the end, just for interest sake, how we used and how you can use these colors now you can, it's a very flexible uh, software, so you can do a lot with it. So now I'm just mostly emphasizing on the basics of how do you identify a, a reinforcing or a balancing loop and what actually it means. Thanks. Yeah, and then there I was just, you know, like explaining again what I had mentioned in there. So yeah, again here, creating um, uh, a, a virtuous cycle to improve quality of care. That's the enforcing loop. So the virtuous cycles are basically those um, where something positive will also reinforce a positive effect in the into the next variable. Whereas the the, um, the other one is the reverse, where we, we you have now the balancing. Um, and it can become a vicious cycle. So where you are trying to increase this and increase in one is actually bringing a decrease into the next variable. Um, yeah, so here we're just talking about, you know, all that, um, the, the HR availability and even how the other variables that we haven't talked, how they can actually affect the system because we've talked about like, for example, drug availability. So it's not just the um, staff attitude and whatever that will increase quality of staff. So you might have a very competent and very motivated um, staff, but if there are no drugs available in the system, if uh, there's no, you know, effectiveness, um, if there's no effective referral system or transportation, and uh, or we in in the uh, interaction diagram, if you remember, if the equipment is broken, like what we had in um, Eastern Cape or Atambo, that like most of their equipment were broken. So they go, they want to assist the, the woman. There's no blood pressure measuring machine. It's been broken and no one is maintaining it. It means two more of this were very well motivated staff uh, member will not be able to produce good quality. So what that statement is saying is simply that we have to still pay attention to these other issues as well, because it is a system. There are components that are supposed to work together. So, and then finally, in terms of leverage points for our Tambo uh, case study, they definitely identified leadership and team building and uh, then sub staff support as major points of leverage, they thought that, especially with the staff support, they thought um, that, you know, they didn't actually require like money or any kind of big investment. All they really needed was uh, a team that is working together with a strong leadership and then supporting each other. So they complained about issues like, so you find a district manager coming to a clinic, and instead of simply, you know, maybe trying to appreciate and understand what is going on on the ground, instead they just come with a list of things that are not working on well, and they are simply, you know, yeah, shouting at you. Why is this like this? Why are your numbers like that? Yeah, you are not doing well, all this and that. So staff said those kind of things are very demotivating. All they need is to find somebody who can, even if they don't, and sometimes they give excuses like, no, I don't, we don't have transport actually to go to the clinics and see them. And of course that was also crushed because they said we have lots of NGOs here that are always going there who we can collaborate with, 
So they realized within the system that actually they had a resource, they can't complain about transport. NGOs do always go to those, they just need to have a program with them. Which days do you go to which areas within our thing? Then the program managers or whatever managers at the district or some district level can make collaborations with them and can never have an excuse that they didn't have a car or fuel to go to, the, to visit the clinics. Secondly, they said, we all have telephones. What is so hard for a, a district manager simply to take a phone call and call a clinic manager, hi, good morning, how are you feeling today? Hope you have a great day. You know, just encourage them. You know, I know it's hard. We don't have this. I, I, I received your email or your note that you are looking for this. We are really trying our best to work on this, but it's just that we are stuck here and there. Just start in, encouraging that, you know, manager at the clinic. They said that alone will leave them very motivated, feel appreciated, feel like, you know, somebody cares. But the way things are done, it's like nobody cares. So even if maybe people had some kind of resources, just looking at the way they are treated, it's, it just makes things really bad. So they said they wanted to do a bit more of that. That was a very key leverage point for them to say this we can definitely do. We can support each other just like at every level. Let everybody just do what is in their power to do. But I didn't follow up with them to say how well did it worked but it was definitely one of the issues. And I've talked about the, the NGOs as well, like how they can actually engage with them and tap on some of their resources. So yeah, um, here I just wanted to show you quickly some of, um, I know our time is gone and uh, I've been asking questions throughout. So I'm not um, hoping that we have so many questions at the end because I, I tried to pause and um, ask, unless they ask the other questions coming through, please do so. But um, so that we don't uh, lose um, you guys before the, uh, we do the pause, I know last time we didn't manage to ask uh, you about what you feel about this process, you know, these webinar series that we are providing. So we had this poll, which we didn't do last time, so I would like to request, um, uh, yeah, you are the Zianda. I was just checking if she's still online. Okay. If you can, I'm yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, if, if you can just put up the pause so that people can, you know, just respond to that. Why I'm just wrapping up so that we don't come to the end and people are getting out and they're not not able to fill in that. So we just appreciate if you can, for those of you who were there last week as well, and uh, for those of us who are, you know, just attended today through what I've presented, what you feel about it. And, you know, we just want to get your feelings around this um, series as we have just started and we want to see whether we should continue with them beginning next, uh, I mean, going on next year. Or is there something that we should be more defined to make them more uh, effective? So I will just continue now with this. So this is what we came up with from the Nigerian uh, case study, the Boko Haram uh, in San Jose. And uh, so just looking at the use of um, these lines, I mean, these, these different colors. So here, we kind of more focused at the, the, the key pathways of uh, insecurity, like what was happening there and what made the, um, the system resilient, where were where, where the sources of resilience. So we didn't like use it very much the way we've done with the Eastern Cape one, where we are trying to find key um, leverage points, so it's like moving forward, of course, in this one as well, they were able to identify what are some of those key leverage points that um, you know we should definitely be working on moving forward in case another crisis comes. What would hold the system in place, or so that they they were still able they are still able to provide services to the people, irrespective of uh, what crisis comes. Like in this case, we are going through this COVID nineteen pandemic. 
did some of those um, things also help them? So here we use these arrows more like looking at the different pathways and how resilience was, you know, shown in this particular system. So like here we have this um, arrow going from insecurity, fear and anxiety, which led to exit of services or programs or, and migration of health workers, the restrictions of technical assistance, which meant that the uh, HR capacity was declined, um, I mean declined, and then also the exiting of those and also migration of health workers meant um, there was less people working in the system. And that also made that there was increased workload amongst those that were left behind. And then here it affected um, quality of health care. So yeah, and then there was another here around difficulty of movements. So even though the, the services might have been there, but people were not able to move across from their homes and utilize the services to uh, they. And also in some cases, they were found to be pressure on a, a health infrastructure. Some of the infrastructure was being demolished and very few left, or there were only a few places what, that were uh, safe enough for people to go to for treatment. So there was a lot of pressure affecting quality of care. And yeah, so like in this, in general, what people picked out some as some of the sources of resilience, there was some community resource and cohesion, whereby, uh, you know, sometimes people then would help each other to take people to hospital or somebody who is in a relatively safe place, even if they are not in your relationship, they could allow you to stay at their place so that then you can go and attend hospital. So that was sort of um, as was how they, they worked out things. And then there was a program on free drug supply uh, for maternal and child health. So I think in their system, everyone has to pay when they go to a health facility. But before that, in, within the system, they had um, a situation where drugs were given for free for uh, women and children. So that acted as a resilience as people lost their incomes. All that information is in here somehow in this jungle. So just as another example of how you can use it. And this was the coded one around the ART treatment and how we did it. We kind of decompartmented it, looking at the different issues that came out, political dynamics, it, drivers of HIV treatment prioritization, all that and maintenance of drug supplies and infrastructure as the drugs were you know, in, in the capital where the, the, uh, the war was taking place and nothing could get out of here, there. So the issues were like, okay, there's a need for decentralization. I think in terms of such crisis, if we had the central medical stores, uh, medical stores you know, decentralized, it would have worked better. But in this case, everything was just stuck in there. They couldn't move medications. So they had to use external sources, the UN bringing in stuff and neighboring countries. And then we had issues around human resource and role of technical partners. Yeah. So you can like use it in different ways on depending on your issue at hand. So I, I guess I'm going to stop there. We will not go to the, you know, so systems dynamics, when you go further to system dynamics modeling, then that's now the next level where you're doing all these simulation models. But in our case study, we didn't do due to a uh, lack of data because here you are look, looking at stocks and flows. So like uh, the example of this um, coded bar would be looking at drugs available in the medical stores. And then the flaws will be the, the supply chain, the transportation issues, what restrictions were happening there. And finally, to the clinic here, which will, where once they arrive there, it will be like another stock or some here, here. And then they will also be taking those drugs to other local um, or satellite clinics within their system. So that's how you can then simulate models to say, okay, if you want so much drugs and the supply chain is like this, this is what the situation will be like at the clinic. 
I know my time is gone, so I will stop there. And just to say we have, um, you know, publications for all these state case studies for those that are interested and lots of material that I can share with you. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I know the questions we have already done. Do we have any questions? Of, um, I'm just checking in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Martina, for a wonderful presentation. Mm. I think we would be open now for um, comments, questions. If you are thinking of using this, if you have any doubts or any questions at all about how practical it is, it looks complex, but it's an enjoyable process because it's a teamwork. Um, if you have anything at all that you want to say, and if you've even tried it or thinking of trying it, um, any comment at all is welcome. <laughs> so um, we are open for yeah. comments. And then we, we have seen that the polls are being filled out. So far, we have 100% across board, which is very good. It means that we are doing something well. So we are grateful for your comments in, in the polls. Please fill them out if you are on board. And um, we still want to know it because this is what we need to be able to improve uh, these webinar series. So thank you so much for those of you who have managed to fill it out. And if you haven't, please go ahead and do that. But thank you also for being positive towards these webinars. Um, otherwise, we, if you want to have a comment, if you've used it and you want to also make a comment about your experience as well, that is equally welcome. Um, yeah. I see Charles, Charles Moroka has his hands on. Thank you so much. This is Charles Muruka speaking from Nairobi. Uh, it is a public holiday in Kenya today, but I think this lecture was just too great and I'm happy that uh, I made the decision to attend. Just one simple question to the professor. Um, the type of software that you've used for the analysis, what is the name and uh, what is the cost? Okay, Thank it's you. called Bensim. Let me check. I think. Um, have... Okay. Okay. So, do you see the the name here, Bensim? Bensim Software is the name, and. Um, so you, you can just register it um, for people who are academics, it's for free. You can use it for free, it's not for pay. As long as you register as um, an academic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. But there are also other software that does similar things, so which are free as well. So you can always look at Corsa Loop, and uh, well, once you Google it, you see a whole lot of um, mm -hmm. softwares available for you to download. Sure. Okay. So let me see. Is there another question? No. So I think we then have come to the end of our session. Thank you so much, Gina, also for moderating and uh, being there. And also Zianda for helping us with the polls and everything. And um, I hope all of us have had a chance to fill in the polls. If not, we will leave this for a few more minutes just to ensure that everybody has had a chance to fill in the polls. Thank you so much. We appreciate your, um, you know, attending this series and we hope that you also be available for the next one where Tumelo and uh, Fidel, we are also in this session will be presenting on social network analysis and that will be on the 10th of November. And we'll definitely uh, remind you or send a reminder, I think a day before in case you may have forgotten about it. Thank you. Um, just a quick one, Martina. So um, I realized that last minute I posted the link 
my mm -hmm. link on my registration link on uh, with my students, the MPH, just outgoing MPH students, and you see a lot of genetics. I'm not inflating the numbers. <laughs> These are oh, okay. actually legitimate individuals. So All maybe right. uh, an additional link where people may spontaneously join will be helpful mm -hmm. without necessarily uh, um, registering. And then also, if you are interested and you know people will be interested, please share the link. So that we can, we you know, uh, learn from these um, um, opportunities. Nice. These are free series, but people actually pay to attend and to learn mm -hmm. about these things. So let's take advantage of them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Zianda, how is it looking with the polls? Are uh, people still filling in? Um, we have 11 responses, 11, oh. yeah, well, it says now 11 out of, so that means it's 100%, but I think um, other colleagues might have left without completing the, okay. the poll, oh, but yeah, but I see so it's 11 people. participants if we, if we host and the host. Okay. Um, but maybe yeah. other people are still adding because I still see there's still quite a few people still online. Thank you. I think, like, for me, I'm using my mobile phone and I cannot even see the poll. Sorry, you can't see the poll. I can't see the poll on the screen. Um, because I'm using my mobile phone. How would that work? Um, it, it should have appeared on your screen and now because I'm closing, I had closed it just now, if I relaunch it, I'm going to wipe out the existing data that we have. So, okay. um, okay. Um, yeah. Can we send it again? Maybe for those who may have left area or for the sake of him who didn't oh it's not possible it would be like a completely new one eh? yeah it would have been a completely new one and if the zoom session it's not possible okay. in the zoom session the question okay Mm. So Charles, maybe I can just send you um, the questions uh, directly to your email. Is that your email, simmuruka at gmail? At, at gmail.com. Okay. Yeah. And I saw, I saw also saw that Wanjala is a Kenyan like me and I wanted to connect with him. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I will I will send you the, the email so that you can just answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siandam. Um yeah, I just wanna see we still.